So we're going to talk about the past, present, and future of U.S. income and wealth inequality, although most of it is going to be income inequality. So I'm going to talk about three main uh, themes here. First of all, just showing you some of the trends in inequality. I'm sure that you've heard a lot about them, but I'm going to show you various dimensions of the problem and some of the newest research that's uh, isolated key characteristics. The second is then going to look at possible explanations. I'm not going to give you a particular answer for that, but I'm going to talk about the various explanations and what's some of the evidence for that. And then finally, possible solutions. Okay, so trends in inequality. All right, to understand the graphs that I'm going to show you, I first want to show you what a society would look like if income were distributed equally. So think of that pie as all the income in the US. If we had perfectly equal distribution, then the people with the lowest 20% of the income, the 20% the of the people with the lowest income would have 20% of the income. The next would have 20%, uh, and it would be 20%. Basically, you would divide the population in five. You couldn't really rank them because everybody was equal, and they would have equal portions. Here's what it looks like in the US. All right. So, the blue is the top, the light blue is the top 20% in terms of income. If we take everybody at the households and rank them, that top 20% earns 50% of all income earned in the United States. Okay, so that's relative to a completely equal distribution of the pie, which would be that slice there of 20%. After that is the next 20% for the top, they earn about 23% of the income. So, so they're, part of the pie is sort of what you would think just in terms of the shape of the entire pie. But then we get to the three bottom quintiles, the, each 20%, and we see how little they have. So the middle fifth has only 15% of the income. The next to the bottom fifth has 8% of the income. And the bottom 20% of households, bottom 20% of households earn only 3% of all income earned in the United States, right? So that gives you sort of a snapshot picture of how unequal income is in the United States right now, or at least in 2012, and it's about the same now. We can also look at this over time, and here's a graph that was produced by uh, Thomas Piketty and Emmanuel Sayers, who Sayers is up at Berkeley. Uh, several years ago, and they update it all the time. You can go to Emmanuel Sayers' website to get it, and now, of course, they have uh, a website for, for these kinds of graphs across uh, many nations. We're not just going to look at the top 20% of the earners now. We're going to look at the top 1%, which means 1 in 100, or the top 0.1%, which means 1 in 1,000. Okay. And we're going to go back, we can actually go back to 1913. And the reason that we can go back that far is that's when they first started the income tax. And so that's why we have good data going back there, because they use tax records from there. So the blue line is the top 1%. Back in 1913, the top 1% earned 18% of all income generated in the United States that year. It remained high. And then something happened in the early part of World War II, okay, 1940s, and income inequality decreased, meaning that top 1% of people were earning a smaller share of the overall income. So that decreased and stayed low for several decades so that that top 1% was earning 7.8% of all income generated in the US, all right? So that was a lower inequality period for the US. But then something happened beginning in the late 70s, early 80s, and income inequality started going back up again. And it kept going back up so that by some measures, this is the piketty sayers measure, now that we're at the same inequality level in terms of the top 1% now that we were back in 1913. That top 1% is earning 18% of all income in the US. The red line. That's the top one in 100. The red line, as I said, shows the top one in 1,000. So that we're back up very close to the inequality level by that measure as well. So that the top one in 1,000 person, household is really what it is, in the US earns 8% of all income in the US. All right. So this shows you the trends. We have basically a U shape. In the early part of the 20th century, it was high. It fell in the mid-20th century, stayed low for several decades, 
and then started rising again in the 1980s. Now let me just say one caveat, and I, didn't, I don't want to get into a lot of measurement issues. There is some evidence that inequality maybe didn't go up quite as much as this said, it says it does, because it, it has gone up, but maybe not quite as much. And the reason is, so I gotta remember not to, do you see that big jump? That big jump is, occurs at the 1986 tax reform. And some people think that some of this is just how income is reported. So some of those jumps might not be so big, but it's increased exactly how much is something that economists love to discuss over and over again, because we want to get the measurement right. But, but in terms of the picture I'm telling you, it, it wouldn't change that picture qualitatively. Here's something uh, else. So this is uh, Raj Chetty, who was at Harvard and is now at Stanford, is doing fascinating research looking at mobility. Because income inequality isn't necessarily so bad if, say, there's a snapshot that shows a lot of inequality, but people can quickly move up the income distribution. What we also care about, though, is whether somebody who's born into the bottom of the income distribution can actually rise up. Okay, and so there's going to be several measures I'll show you there. This first one is, can, do children end up doing better than their parents? So on the horizontal line is the year in which a child is born. So the first year that we have there is 1940, and the last year is 1985. And then you follow them into adulthood, and I think he's following them to age 30 or something. I, I can't remember exactly. Somebody born in 1940, 90% of those children ended up doing better than their parents in terms of earnings, their household earnings. Okay? That stayed high for a while, but then it started falling and fell so that somebody born in 1985 is currently earning only 50% only of those children are actually doing better than their parents if you look at earnings and adjust for inflation. All right. So the whole, you know, each generation doing better than the last, for the most part, that story is disappearing. It also really varies geographically. This again is from Raj Chetty. This is the geography of upward mobility in America. All right. So this is, what is the probability if you're a child born into the bottom 20% of the income distribution? Remember those people not earning very much at all. What is the probability that you could actually reach the top 20% of the income distribution? So the lighter colors are the good places, meaning they have more upward mobility. The darker red to uh, burgundy have the least upward mobility. So you can see the south has very little upward mobility relative to the rest of the country. Um, also, what we call the Rust Belt, going up into Ohio. Um, places that do relatively well, parts of the Midwest, although one kind of wonders how much population there really is there <laughs> on the way to that. Um, the coast does relatively well. California does quite well. Um, Portland doesn't look so good. Seattle's not great. But you can see that there's a lot of variation, that it really depends on where you were born in terms of what your chances are of having good upward mobility. And this is just one particular measure of it. All right, what I'm going to talk about now is the importance of skill for these trends in in income inequality that I just showed you. All right, so here is wage growth. So we're going from looking at sort of household earnings to looking at actual wages of people. And we're going to look at it both by uh, gender, but also by education. And that's the important part here. So to explain these graphs, these are from David Otter. So what we're going to do is just normalize so that whatever education level you have, we're going to just put that as 1 in 1963. Because this way, we can see how much your wage has increased relative to somebody in a different education level. This is going to be real wages, which means we've adjusted for inflation, and it's full-time workers. The dark blue line at the bottom is somebody who's a high school dropout. Okay? The next line up, the red line, is somebody who's a high school graduate but never went to any more, anything else. No junior college, no regular college. Green is some college, so that might be somebody who went to junior college but didn't go on to a four-year college. 
Or it could be somebody who went to a four-year college but dropped out before getting their degree. The sort of orangish line is somebody who has a bachelor's degree but no more. So they went to a four-year college, got a bachelor's degree, but no more. And then the light blue line at the top is people who have a higher degree than bachelor's degree. So this could be master's, it could be PhD, MD, JD, any of those sorts of degrees. So what do we see here? This starts in 1964, because that's when we started really being able to count this in a, a particular government series, up through 2012. Okay. So notice that in the early years, let, let's look at men, just because that's a little bit less complicated. The, the story for women is broadly the same, but there, there are some variations there because of the uh, increases for women overall. Everyone had significant wage growth in the 1960s up through the early 1970s. Okay, everyone was doing well. Yes, proportionally, the more educated were doing even better, but there wasn't that much difference. Then something happened in the early 1970s, and I'm gonna talk about this later. And everybody had either stagnant or low real wage growth, so going down during the 1970s. During the 1980s, we started getting more of a splitting apart. So it kept going down and down and down for the least educated, but then started taking off for the more educated. The people with a bachelor's degree and people with a more than a bachelor's degree. And you can see that their real wage growth has just been much greater than any other categories. And for people who are uh, high school dropouts or even just a high school degree, theirs has just been stagnant since the early 1990s. Okay, so a big part, the reason that you've gotten in increased inequality is because wage growth has been very healthy during most periods for the higher educated uh, individuals. But for the lower educated individuals, after their boom during the 60s, and it, that was also happening in the 50s, if you go back to some other data, they're, they're stagnated and even went down. Suppose you want to uh, be a millionaire, other than going on a, a TV show and uh, uh, winning something. Here's the share of families headed by someone over age 40 with a net worth above $1 million by highest level of educational attainment of, of the, somebody in that household. So 40% of the families who are millionaires are from a household with a graduate or professional degree. All right, so these are the MDs and the JDs and the MBAs. Four-year degree, this is uh, something like 22%. And then you see the rest of the education levels and very few, that they account for very little of the people who have a net worth over a million dollars. All right, so it also shows up, so I showed you wages before, but now you can see it by how they accumulate wealth. And if you have higher education, on average, you're going to have much higher wealth. OK. Now, the plight of the less educated in the US. Uh, I ac actually added this since I gave this talk at Town & Gown uh, last spring, because I saw an amazing paper by uh, Angus Deaton and Ann Case. So if you think the income and wage statistics look bad, consider the following. So work by Ann Case and Angus Deaton, who won the Nobel Prize a couple years ago, has been looking at trends in mortality in the US versus other countries, and particularly for the less educated. One of the things they look at is what they call deaths of despair. These are deaths by drugs, such as opioid overdose, alcohol, often cirrhosis of the liver, or suicide, okay? This is for white non-Hispanics, all right? So there's, there are no racial issues coming in to play here. These are white non-Hispanic, age 50 to 54, by level of education. And this is from 1998 to 2015. The blue line that's at the top and rising significantly is men with a high school degree or less. Their death rate per 100,000 people started higher than the rest of the population, but then has really increased. Women with high school degree or less are also seeing an increase, although their level lies below the men's, but they're still seeing an increase. The two dotted lines are the more educated people. The blue is men with a bachelor's degree or more, 
So this would also include the graduate uh, degrees. And the red line is women with a bachelor's degree or more. They're at a much lower level and you just don't see a trend in these deaths of despair among the more educated. Among the less educated, you see a big increase in the deaths of despair. Here it is by country to show you that there's something unique about the US by age, for age 50 to 54, and WNHs are white non-Hispanics, okay? So uh, that's what that means. So you can see that the deaths per 100,000 in terms of these deaths of despair, again, suicide, drug overdose, and alcohol-related deaths, are going down in most countries or are flat. So Germany really comes down, France is coming down, Sweden comes down and then you know, is mostly flat. Canada goes up a little bit, Australia goes up a little bit, but they're just much lower. It's also United Kingdom. The red line is the US. Basically starting around 2000, the deaths of despair just started skyrocketing in the US among white non-Hispanics. So again, there are no sort of racial composition issues in these data. This is showing up in total mortality for this group. And, and let me also say, the white non-Hispanics, this is not just the lower educated, this is all white non-Hispanics in the US, I, I'm pretty sure. But what's happening to the lower educated is impacting the totals for the US. Here's the mortality rate, either raw or age adjusted, for, for all deaths, okay? Germany, France, Canada, United Kingdom, everybody, mortality's going down, except in the US. In the US, it turned around and started going back up again, again, around 2000, all right? So mortality rates are rising in the US, okay? And much of, most of that is going on at the lower education levels, and most of that is going on at the lower income levels. So that sort of gives the, the human, direct human cost of what's going on in terms of inequality. All right, possible explanations. So here I'm just gonna talk through and give a graph for explanations that people have talked about over time. All right, so immigration, you've heard a lot about that. Let me just show you a graph. This is the percent of the population that is foreign born in the US from 1850 to 2013. Okay, so after the big wave of immigration, we were up to about 14% of the population was foreign born. Then in the 1920s, they started putting on restrictions on immigration, as you know, and immigration came way down in the early 1970s, but then it started going up again and so the percent foreign born right now is 14%, okay? So remember that U shape of inequality that I'd shown you, here's a U shape. Now one U shape correlating, you know, there's plenty of other things that have U shapes over the 20th centuries, but it's noting that kind of thing that have led some people to wonder if there is some relationship with immigration. Now, of course, the, the immigrants are different, you know, there was the Irish and the Polish and the Italian immigrants, Immigrants from many countries now, a lot of course has been uh, immigrants from Mexico and other Latin American countries and now uh, also from Asia. And the question is what kind of impact this could be having. And the reason is that most immigrants tend to be lower skilled. And the idea is that they might, be, there's sort of two ways that that could affect inequality statistics. One way is simply a composition effect, all right? So if somebody who's very low skilled comes into the US and that increases the fraction who are low skilled, then that could lead to uh, more inequality statistics, uh, greater inequality. But then there's also a question of whether that somehow the competition is driving down wages of the native born low skilled. And there's of course a huge debate in the economics literature on that. It's hard to show either way that there's a big effect. Okay, but, that, but because of that U shape, that's something that's attracted attention for, for quite a while, even before the politicians uh, got a hold of it. All right, unionization. This is uh, something else that people have talked about. Here's a graph that shows the percent of workers who were in unions starting from 1930 to 2010. The blue line is the percent of employed workers. It's a series that goes back further. And the red line is the percent of wage and salary workers. 
Basically, in the 1930s, unionization went way up because part of the New Deal programs gave uh, more power to unions. Okay, so, so many more workers joined unions. Unions remained very strong through the 40s, 50s, 60s, somewhat in the 70s, but you can see that that came down quite a bit so that the fraction of workers who are unionized now is much lower than before. And some people have wondered whether that could have an effect on inequality, that to the extent that unions advocate for the less skilled workers, uh, they may not be earning as high wages because they don't have advocates. Trade. Here's a really interesting graph that I had come up with um, when I gave this talk before. Here's the US merchandise trade balance going back to 1895 up to 2015. And what's so interesting about this, you know, I hadn't realized this till I saw this graph. This is as a percent of GDP, so it, it, what it does is kind of adjust for the scale of the U.S. economy. We were always running a surplus or, or had, you know, balanced trade up until the early 1970s, which was the end of the Bretton Woods era when we went from fixed exchange rates to flexible exchange rates. And basically since then, we've had trade deficits, and not only that, trade deficits that increase as a percent of GDP. So uh, the trade deficit is just huge now by you know, any kind of standards, any kind of historical standards. And of course, you've heard many people talk about the effects of uh, tr competition from trade on US wages. And some of the work by Gordon Hansen here with others has suggested that uh, China entering the World Trade Organization in 2000 could have had a big effect on jobs in the U.S. All right, something else that the public doesn't always hear about, well, at least with these words, skill bias, technological change. But if I say robots, which is just one particular example, you might have uh, heard more about it from uh, the press. So skill bias, technological change is technolo technological change that benefits high-skilled workers and replaces low-skilled workers. Okay, so let me give an example, professor and secretary. So when I came to the department, I think that uh, uh, Ted Groves, who's sitting right there, was department chair, and uh, we had the following issue. The new people coming in could do their own word processing, the new faculty. The older faculty would write things out on paper and then give them to, I think back the word processors, I think we moved from secretary to word processor then, and then they would type them up. Well, this new technology, and, and, and actually Ted was always at the forefront of the technology, he had email before anybody else. This new technology basically increased the productivity of the professors, because rather than writing something out and then having to have somebody else type it up, we could just do it all at once. But then it replaced all of our word processors, and so it was, it was a painful adjustment when we had to uh, try to reallocate some staff from word processing to something else. So that's an, just one example of many of the ways that technology can be skill biased, where it favors the skilled and replaces the less skilled. Here's another one. Consider the automobile industry innovations in the 1920s versus now. So here's a Ford assembly line in the 1920s. Uh, this, is, this technological innovation really increased the productivity of the less skilled. Okay? By just reorganizing activities and figuring out this idea of the assembly line, you could take low skilled workers and make them really productive because each one was specializing for one place on the assembly line. You know, Just putting on, say, this kind of, uh, axis or this windshield or something like that. Let's compare that to the technological innovations more recently in the auto industry. Here's the F-150 production at today's Ford Dearborn truck plant. Robots replace the low skilled. Now there are some workers in there, but they're guys who are sitting at the computer terminals controlling the robots, all right? And you have to have a higher skill for that than just you know, the assembly lines. So you can see both were really important technological innovations but they had very different effects on the demand for low-skilled workers and the productivity of the high-skilled. There's something else called the economics of superstars where technology also has an effect. Sherwin Rosen wrote a, a classic paper on this in 1981. The technology allows the stars 
you know, music stars, whatever kind of stars you want, to reach a broader market and crowd out the less talented, all right? So top musical performers, all right? You could hire a band or you could just play, you know, Michael Jackson, all right? Because we have CDs. Now, obviously, it started with gramophones and those sorts of things. But do you want to pay for your local quartet uh, to be at your party, or do you just want to take, you know, whoever's the best performance in the world of a particular piece and put a CD on, all right? So that really changes. You can see how inequality within an occupation can increase so much. This is also known as winner-take-all markets. Okay, so I'm going to talk about why I think the American middle class prospered so much during the 1950s and 1960s. And just as a little bit of background, let me give you an idea. My father did not go to college. He was an electrician. He went to uh, the Panama Canal Zone uh, during World War II and worked there for over 30 years. And with the kind of income, we had a very nice lifestyle there with his electrician skills. He rose up as high as you could go, uh, became operations supervisor for one of the locks in the Panama Canal. And his daughter went on and got her PhD. That wasn't so unusual back then. And so that's where you know, the children doing better than their parents really worked well. And let me give you some of my theories about why that worked. Okay. So first of all, there was important legacies from the 1920s to the 1940s. Number one, there was a massive expansion of education in the United States. The US led the rest of the world. And there's a wonderful book by Claudia Gold and Larry Katz about uh, education expansion in the US. This is the percent of the population, 25 years and over, who completed high school or college by age group for selected years. Okay. So let's look at the upper pink line, which is uh, people ages 25 to 29, so young people in their 20s, but beyond uh, college age, typically, who have completed high school. So you can see that that number really shoots up through the early 1970s, but then flattens out afterwards. Okay. What was going on before is there was an important progressive movement that really advocated expanding high schools so that most people could go to high schools. There was also a lot of demand from industry because they thought that what was taught in high schools was very useful for giving uh, their future workers skills. So there was a huge increase there. But then it flattened out at around 85% of the population. The, if you look down below the pink line, that is college completion. Of course, that was much lower. Hardly anybody went to college early in the 20th century. There's a big blip up during uh, the late 40s, early 50s. Does everybody know why that is? GI Bill. GI Bill, exactly. And then there was also an increase in the 60s and 70s. Gentle increases, but um, you know, not, not anything as dramatic as some of those jumps that you saw earlier. All right. So one thing is, over this time period, we just had massive expansion of education. That meant we had a much more skilled uh, labor force. Second, innovation soared in the second half of the 1930s, right? still during the Great Depression. But if you start looking at counts of important technological innovations, they just soared in the second half of the 30s, went on through the 1940s during World War II and afterwards. And that led to several decades of very high labor productivity growth, okay? Because basically technological innovations is technological innovations and education, and then along with uh, building factories and things, which I won't show here, is what increases your labor productivity. And if you have high labor productivity, you tend to have high wages. Now notice, so I've actually put this in a form so that the slope shows you the growth rate here. Notice how much higher the growth rate of labor productivity was from the second half of the 1930s through about 19, late 60s, early 70s, and then how it just really flattened out. So labor productivity growth really slowed down starting in the early 1970s. It picked up a few little times, but it's just much slower overall than it was during those previous decades. Now remember I had shown you this graph before with uh, wage growth by different education levels. I'm going to put that line in there of what's been dated as the productivity growth slowdown. Notice that when productivity growth was high, everybody was benefiting. But once it slowed down, 
you know, nobody was growing. And even though it's remained slow, the higher educated people are still getting ahead, but the lower educated people aren't getting ahead. Something's happening with the innovation, the technology, maybe even the quality of education that's making it so that you have slower labor productivity growth and hence slower wage growth for people who don't have a very high education. A third is uh, the New Deal legislation, which strengthened unions. So union membership went from 7% of employed workers in 1930 to 27% in 1940. And there's that same graph that I showed you. Had a big increase, stayed high for a while before it started going down. The other thing is, at the end of World War II, the other economic powers, Germany, Great Britain, Japan, lay in ruins. As a result, US companies dominated the world in the production of high value items, particularly high value items. Let me show you a graph. This is the share of world motor vehicle production. All right, so all motor vehicles produced in the world. That graph starts in 1950 and ends sometime in the, about 2012. Okay. The big blue area is the US. So in 1950, the US produced 75% of all cars produced in the world. Okay. Second biggest was the light blue, which is Great Britain. Uh, France is the maroon. Green is Germany. The yellow is Japan. Notice how small that is until the 1960s. And that's when Japan really starts taking off. So you can see the yellow area gets bigger and bigger. You know, when all, these other areas are getting big, notice that the US area is shrinking more and more as a fraction of world motor vehicle production. Then we start getting some others, and notice the kind of yellowish area at the top. Anybody guess what that is, if you can? China, yes, OK? China is now growing much more in terms of world motor vehicle production. And the US is only at, oh, maybe 14, 13%, 14% of all vehicles, all right? So this is what I'm saying is the US had sort of a monopoly, not quite, you know, had a lot of what we call market power worldwide in uh, motor vehicles in the 50s and the 60s. So all of these pieces I gave you are parts of uh, the story that George Borjas, who was on the faculty here then, who's now at Harvard, uh, wrote up in a paper in 1995. And I've expanded and updated some because many things have happened since then. But the story, I think, still stays the same. So this is our story. In the 1950s and 1960s, if you look at the world, U.S. business dominates the world. Okay? There's little competition from other companies, other workers. Imagine the 1950s and 60s. No U.S. company, even if they were allowed to, would ever locate in China. Remember, Mao Zedong was in China. It was a communist country. All right. This meant that they have what we call monopoly rents, meaning that they could charge a price much higher than their costs uh, to sell cars. Um, that meant that they made a lot of profits, and that went right to those companies. So one example is Ford. But this was also happening in steel and many of the other big industries. But in part because of all that New Deal legislation, unions were quite strong. So the unions would bargain on behalf of their workers with those big companies and take all of those uh, goodies that they were getting from the rest of the world in terms of profits and make them share them with the workers. And that resulted in the high wages. So that's why less educated people could do so well in the 50s and 60s in the US, because there were plenty of manufacturing jobs, and they were being paid very high wages. I know people who said that the, you know, Europeans would come to the US in the 50s and 60s, the more educated ones typically, and were just astounded at the high standard of living of the less educated workers in the US at that time. But what happened starting in the 1970s? Well, we started getting competition from other com countries. So Toyota, you know, Japan was one of the first big ones uh, with Toyota, and then later on Korea with Hyundai. That meant with all of that competition, there was a decrease in what we call monopoly rents of US companies. They couldn't get away charging such a high price. And remember all those low quality cars we used to have in the 50s and 60s that always broke down that they could get away with because there was no competition? 
And then we started seeing the Japanese cars and say, wow, you know, they don't break, they have to break down every year, all right? So there was all kinds of, you know, suddenly uh, General Motors had to invest in quality and that cut into their profits. Um, but then there was something else that happened, particularly starting, you know, several decades later, and that's foreign workers. And this is an example of Chinese workers. There was increased competition from foreign workers. After Mao Zedong died, Deng Xiaoping basically switched China to, it was still communist, but to more of a capitalist kind of system. And so it's not unheard of at all. I mean, many, many US companies are willing to put their plants over there because they have really good workers over there who have plenty of skill for many of the manufacturing goods. So there's increased competition for foreign workers. That led to decreased bargaining power of unions and lower wages for US low-skilled workers. Right? So notice the story here, because a lot of people think that, oh, if we could only get the unions back, then the low-skilled workers would be better off. Our argument is the unions could only help the lower-skilled workers when there were all these rents to be shared. And if there is a really small profit margin, it's going to be really hard to get that for the workers because there's always this competition from abroad uh, where they can just move overseas. Now there is an upside of globalization because what we're talking about here is globalization. This is the percent of the world population that lives on a dollar a day, which is hard to believe, but that number was 27% in 1970. It is now about 6%, okay? So this represents a dramatic increase in the standard of living for a lot, you know, going from barely alive to uh, you know, being able to survive. The other thing is, as many people say, what has happened in China since Deng Xiaoping took over has lifted more people out of poverty more quickly than any other era, any other time in history. All right, hundreds of millions of people have been lifted in China from abject poverty to reasonable middle class standard of living. So there's, so there's always an upside and that's the upside to it. Now, why did labor productivity growth slow down? As I said, it started in the early 1970s and it occurred across the industrialized countries. There are many potential explanations, but really still is a mystery. And uh, a book I can really recommend by a friend of mine who's a professor at Northwestern, Robert Gordon, it's called The Rise and Decline of U.S. Economic Growth. It compares uh, what was happening on, uh, earlier, back in the late 19th century to the present. And he says that people just aren't coming up with good ideas anymore. But then the question is, why were they able to come up with good ideas before and not now? But that's you know, one of the problems there. All right, let me talk a little bit about these skills again. We're thinking about the present and future of inequality and standards of living. So there's something called the race between education and technology, and that's a phrase coined by Dutch economist Jan Tinbergen. And the idea is, the technological changes often increase the demand for skilled workers. Not always, but many of them do increase the demand for skilled workers. So in order to keep inequality of income in check, you have to have a steady increase in the supply of skilled workers. Because if the demand growth starts outstripping the supply growth, then the wages of the skilled go up relative to the wages of the less skilled. If the race is won by technology, Inequality tends to increase because demand is outstripping supply. But if the race is won by education, meaning supply is growing more quickly, then inequality tends to decrease. And that's what people think happened during the 1940s, 50s, and 60s because there was such a huge expansion of education that the, uh, education was winning the race then. What people think now is that because education is stagnating, educational levels, but technology is, is progressing ahead that now technology is winning the race and that's leading to the increase in inequality. Now if we compare to other OECD countries, uh, the US skill distribution sort of stands out and these are from uh, a recent paper by uh, some researchers at the OECD and their paper is forthcoming in a volume that I edited called 
I can never remember exact title, but Skills Technology and the Future of U.S. Economic Growth. So this is uh, where we had a lot of papers on exactly the topic I'm talking about now. How do they measure skills here? This is adult competencies. So they go uh, measure for adults in all these countries. These are the PIAC scores. Uh, how well, what their proficiency is on numeracy and on literacy, and I think there are some others. What they focus on here is numeracy. And let me show you. Here is the average skill level across a whole bunch of OECD countries, and the green is the United States. So we have to feel good because we are ahead of Italy and Spain. <laughs> and I know when this study came out, I happened to be uh, flying on an airplane uh, from Germany to Italy. And all of the Italians were reading the newspaper just looking really distressed <laughs> that they had done so poorly on uh, this because they were at the bottom of the pile. We're just third from the bottom of the pile on average skill levels. But inequality is high. Skill inequality is high in the US. So US is over here. This is the skill level of the top 10%, that's what P90 means, to the bottom 10% of the population. So you take all of these numeracy skill levels for the US, say, and you see the people who scored the top 10% of the scores versus the bottom 10% of the scores. And that's the ratio of the two. And you do it in every country, and you can see that both France and the United States have a lot of inequality in skills, all right? The top 10% does a lot better than the bottom 10%. The least uh, unequal is the Slovak Republic. Japan also has much lower inequality. Finland as well. Uh, but France and the US are quite high. And it's not, there's not much inequality if we look at the top 10% versus the middle person, the median. So that's the black line. But we do have it for the median versus the bottom 10%. So what that means is it's that bottom 10% that's doing so badly in the US that's causing a lot of that inequality in skills here. They're just being able to do basic numeracy. Now something else about the US is that the returns to skill are high. So the returns to skill is how much higher wage you have if you have more skill. Sometimes we measure that by education. Here, it's in terms of how they did on this exam. So we're at the top of the graph, and if you're skilled in the US, you get a much higher return relative to somebody who's not so skilled in the US than in other countries. Thus, a key to reducing inequality, I suggest, is trying to raise the skills of the people at the bottom in the US. That's a really important issue. There are other ways to do it, you know, issues with uh, uh, monopoly power at the very top and people skimming, but in terms of raising the bottom, uh, it's that skill distribution. But there are challenges, all right? There are inequality in test scores, inequality in the home environment, and problems in K through 12 education. Here is cognitive scores, um, how they're linked to maternal education. All right, and this is by age of the child. And here's the point. The score at the top is the children of, it's, yeah, children of a mother who's a college graduate. The next one is children of mother who has some college, but not a four-year college degree. Down below is children of mother of whose mothers have a high school uh, degree, but nothing more, and below that, less than high school, okay? So the children's cognitive performance is really related to the mother's education. Also, achievement gaps have really increased. So this is uh, some nice work done by Sean Reardon, who's at the Stanford Education uh, School. This is the average difference in reading standardized test scores between the 90th, which means the top 10%, and the bottom 10% income percentile families. So what we're gonna do is take children from the top 10% and look at their reading standardized test where their parents are in the top 10% of the income distribution and children whose parents are in the bottom 10% of the income distribution, let's look at their scores. And let's look at this over time from 1943 to 1990, about 2000. 
And the point he makes here is that since 1970, the, the achievement gap between those kids at the top versus the kids at the bottom, based on their parents' education, has really increased over time. So that suggests that, so far this is just a correlation, your parents' income level seems to matter a lot more now for how well your kids do in school than it used to. Okay? This, of course, goes right back to the graph that I gave you before that, said, that talked about uh, mobility. What's your chance of getting out of the bottom 20% if you were born in the bottom 20% of the income distribution? Home environment. Um, Low-income children are more likely to come from unstable families. There are lots of correlations that unstable family leads to, to lower educational achievement. Low-income parents put less time into their children, and their children spend less time studying. As a result, low-income children enter school with lower cognitive and non-cognitive skills and tend to learn less in school. So some work that I had done before with my husband, Gary Ramey, called, it was a paper called The Rug Rat Race. Um, we looked at the time spent with children by parents, this one's mothers, we also see it for fathers, by the education level of the mother. Blue is college educated, it means college educated or more, and the red is less than college. And what's interesting here is from the 1960s to the early 1990s, there wasn't that much difference between the two of them. There was always some difference, people have noted that all the way back to the 1920s. But then something happened in the early 1990s, and college-educated mothers started spending much more time with their children. We linked it to all the different activities. Less educated mothers also increased the amount of time, but by much less than the college-educated mothers. So children who grow up in a household with a college-educated mother are just much more likely to have parental time inputs, uh, which is an important part of their skill formation process. Problems in kindergarten through 12 school, ever since international test score comparisons were first conducted in the 1960s, the US has lagged other industrialized countries. Uh, remember after Sputnik, uh, the US panicked about, you know, when they saw how good the Russian kids were doing in school, uh, particularly on math and science, compared to the US. Despite many efforts and many experiments, little progress has been made. These are some of the more depressing graphs I've seen. So let me, you don't need to know the details. This is test scores on the National Assessment of Educational Progress. The top is reading, the bottom is math. Starts in 1971, ends in 2012. For all the hand wringing that we have done about education, all the resources, trying to improve the quality of the schools, those lines are pretty flat. Okay, so we're not seeing much improvement there. Also, US students lag behind their international peers. If you look at reading, we're 24 on this list. Math, 36th. Science, 28th. You know, Vietnam. Is ahead, right? Vietnam is number eight in science, right? They had a civil war there for decades, and we're 28. You know, I, and they're much lower income. It's just a stand. Same with all of the others. Of course, we know about you know China and Taiwan and South Korea, but Finland also manages to be really high up on most of these lists. So, so one doesn't, you know, it manages to work in places outside of Asia, and, you know, the question is why uh, the U.S. can't achieve that. Okay, now some people say, well, K through 12 is so bad, just send them all to college. <laughs> Good for us, you know, high demand, but according to a new BLS study, this is actually also in this conference volume that I'm editing that's forthcoming, only 25% of jobs actually say they require a college degree. Um, what they want is they want people who are hardworking and relatively smart, but you don't have to go to college to have those attributes. And, and in fact, that's how it used to be, where you know, many people did very well without having gone to college. Uh, many students graduate from high school ill-prepared for rigorous college. So you can't just say, oh, they didn't teach them anything in K through 12, just uh, send them to college. Many of these people go to for-profit, non-selective colleges, too often they take on debt and end up not achieving high enough income because they just weren't prepared for college level work. So to summarize, inequality continues to rise. 
A large part is accounted for by the distribution of skills combined with the high returns to skills. There are other issues, you know, CEO pay, all that kind of thing I haven't touched on just for time constraints, but, um, but the skill distribution is a big part of it. We are unlikely to return to the situation in the 1950s and 1960s when the less skilled individuals could still prosper. Uh, so it seems that an important uh, way to, to try to do something about inequality would be, at least going forward, would be to raise the skill levels. But as I showed you, we face some pretty serious challenges uh, because we don't seem to be able to raise skill levels very much in K through 12, and um, not everybody can go to college. All right, thank you. Thank you.